Well, good evening, everybody. It's a pleasure to uh, see you all here. It's, uh, my name is Frank Cowell. For those of you who don't know me, I'm uh, one of the editors of Economica. And as you probably know, this is uh, one of a series of lectures sponsored by Economica. Uh, it's our third Coast lecture. On previous occasions, we've had uh, Oliver Hart and uh, Jean Tirole. And tonight, we're delighted to have uh, Professor Ernst Fair. Uh, professor Fair is a uh, professor of uh, microeconomics and experimental economics and director of the Department of Economics at the uh, University of Zurich. He's a former president of the European Economic Association and he's uh, a doctorate of the University of Vienna. He's widely known for his research on uh, the origins of human altruism, Really work on social preferences, work on bounded rationality, the neurobiological foundations of social and economic behavior, and the foundations of incentives. And so he felt he would be an excellent person to give the Coase lecture when you think that Coase, back in 1937, wrote that production could be carried on without any organization, that is, any firms at all. So why and under what conditions should we expect firms to emerge? And I thought of that remark when I uh, read the title of the interesting lecture we're going to hear this evening, The Lure of Authority, Motivation and Incentive Effects of Power. So, Professor Fair, please. So, thank you very much for the invitation to give the lecture. I'm very delighted to be here and to present some new stuff we did the last one and a half years on the lure of authority. And uh, so uh, to start with, let me give you an outline of my lecture. So what I will do is I will first talk about the relevance of authority, the economic relevance of authority. Then I will ask question, do people value authority per se? regardless or independently of the income consequences of being in a position of authority. And finally, uh, I will uh, talk about the motivation effects of authority. And in particular, I ask the question, does possession of authority increase intrinsic effort motivation, and does lack of authority decrease it? And uh, at the beginning, I also want to give some acknowledgments, because it's not just my me that did the work. Uh, I have been collaborating with Björn Bartling and Holger Hertz from the University of Zurich and Tom Wilkening from the University of Melbourne. And two papers are the, so to speak, the ground, prepared the ground for my lecture. One is the paper that gave the lecture its title with uh, Holger Hertz and Tom Wilkening, and the other is together with Bartling and Hertz on the value of authority. So <clears throat> what is authority? What, I mean, there are many possible definitions if you go back, if you go into the social science literature. I take a pragmatic approach. Uh, I will focus on a, you might say, not totally general form of authority, but that's also not my goal. I will focus on authority as the right to make decisions in an organization that affects other people's payoff. So I make a decision in an organization and that decision typically affects many people's payoffs if I'm in a position of authority. And one example could, for example, be the, the right to choose a project from a set of available projects. Projects have different distributional implications and so different people have different preferences over the different projects. Uh, and the person who is in authority to make the decision here uh, has clearly a superior position. Notice that uh, my approach here, or my, yeah, my focus here, is related to Herman si Herbert Simon's definition of authority, who said, authority is the right to take actions affecting part or the whole of an organization. Now, why should we study authority? I, th I think some of the reasons are quite obvious. I mean, authority is everywhere, in a sense. The LSE is a, you could view the LSE as a set of authority relations, basically. Uh, and so, so basically all kinds of public administrations, firms, political offices are pervaded by authority relationships. Somebody has decision rights and others are effect, affected by the decisions taken. 
And in the last 10 to 15 years, economists also became increasingly interested. There's a whole subfield called organizational economics that deals with issues of authority allocation. And uh, uh, the prevailing view now is that contracts in organizations are often incomplete, that this gives rise to hold up problems and moral hazard problems. And that assignment of authority helps mitigate these problems. It can lead to second best solutions. So economists have taken a, a quite, economists' general view on, on authority can probably be summarized as follows. In our view, or in the prevailing, in the view, so the prevailing opinion is that authority is a means to an end. It's an institutionally wise that can be deliberately shaped in order to achieve a more efficient allocation of uh, resources. That's the view taken in organizational economics. Or in political economy, uh, we sometimes uh, think that authority is a means to extract income and rents. Because I have a superior position. If I have the right to make a decision, in principle, I could extract some bribes from you uh, to make a more favorable decision to you. And I mean, we know that uh, in part, some parts of the world there's a lot of corruption where, where people who have authority um, take advantage of that by, for example, getting bribes. Now, uh, in this view, authority has no value per se. Uh, so individuals do not place a positive value on authority beyond its income generating aspects. And uh, that. Uh, and, and in addition, authority is also assumed to not affect intrinsic motivation. So they are basically, so it affects effort provision solely through its effect on economic incentives. So there are two basic assumptions in the literature. Authority has no value per se and does not affect intrinsic motivation. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to challenge these assumptions with some empirical work. But before I do that, I relate this to the to the famous work by Ronald Coase, who gave the, this lecture its name. I mean, he put forward this idea that by its very nature, the firm constitutes a set of authority relations. I mean, he didn't frame it in this way, but it's implicit, basically, in his Economica paper from the 1930s. <coughs> and basically, the question, his view was that vertical integration, that means authority relationships, replace market-based allocation of resources uh, by, uh, through uh, authority-based allocation of resources. And now, the implications are very clear. If it's really true that people value authority per se, and that an authority has important motivational consequences, then that affects the vertical integration decision. That affects the allocation of authority within the firm uh, and if you like, also between firms. So it has immediate implications for how, for at least for the margins, and, and I will come to these economic implications uh, when I have shown you my empirical results. Okay, so I give you at the beginning an overview of the results, and then I am going to present them. Uh, so do people value authority per se? I already gave an answer to that. Yes, we find a majority of subjects values authority per se. Uh, does authority motivate additional effort provision? The answer is again, yes, many subjects with authority provide extra effort over and beyond what would be reasonable to provide if, if, if just the other motives that we consider in economics would play a role. And finally, uh, does lack of authority demotivate effort provision? And the answer is again, par partial yes. Yes, it completely demotivates a substantial minority of subjects. So what I should add here is, not everybody. So this is, these two findings, is, it's really a majority of subjects who behaves like that. Here, it's a significant minority, let's say 40% in our experiments who behave like that. And uh, so, but the interesting thing is here, uh, that the other 60%, let's say, they don't behave like that. And there's a, a distinction between these two types of people. So there, there, there is a conjecture here, uh, which we can't yet uh, validate. We haven't done em enough empirical work. But there might be types out there, people who really 
resist being under the authority of others or being strongly demotivated when being in a position of lack of authority and other people who are not demotivated. Which would imply that companies carefully have to select peoples, the people they put into different positions. Now, so these are claims. Now let me, let me show you how we derive, how, we, how I prove that these claims, so to speak. And my, basically 95% of the rest of my talk will be devoted to the value of authority. Proving empirically that people place a positive value on authority. And then my, my final two slides will be devoted to, to the effort question, uh, just for reasons of time. Those who are interested, so the pap one paper is on the web. It's a paper by Fairhertz and Wilkening on motivation and incentive effects of power. We have an extensive discussion on the, on the effort consequences of having authority or not having authority. So our workhorse is an authority gain. What does that mean? Well, there's a principal and an agent, and they are matched and can implement the project. Two available project variants, or two available versions of the project, you might say, uh, are there, and, but they result in different payoffs to the principal and to the agent. One variant of the project favors the principal in terms of payoff, the other favors the agent. I'll give you an example soon. Now initially the principal has authority, but he can delegate it to the agent. Uh, and then, when I use the term controlling party, by the way, I mean the party who is in, who possesses authority, okay? That's initially the principal, but the principal can delegate authority and then the agent would be the controlling, become the controlling party. So, Whoever is the controlling party, the controlling party can decide on the variant that is implemented, and this party can choose an implementation effort. The subordinate party makes no payoff relevant decisions and is just a passive recipient of payoffs. And in addition, we make the assumption that there is costly effort by the controlling party, and this costly effort determines the probability of the success of the project, the probability of implementation success. So what's the trade-off for the principal here when he makes a decision? So if I consider to delegate or not, if I delegate, then the agent has to put forward implementation effort, and I save the implementation effort. So I save effort cost. But if I delegate, I give the agent control over which variant will be chosen, and he will typically choose the variant that favors him and not me. Uh, by losing control, I lose some income, but I also gain some income because I save my effort cost. So this is the trade-off, the principal phases. And this can be, uh, well, before I show you the game tree, a possible game tree of that game, this is the type of effort structure we had. So for example, there is variant A and variant B. And in variant A, the principal gets 200 and the agent 150. And in variant B, it's the other way around. So this is the conflict of interest. Uh, so if effort is successful, of course. If effort is unsuccessful, so if the project fails, if the implementation of the project fails, they get a kind of reservation payoff or outside uh, option payoff or whatever you want to call it. So that's both get 100. The cost function in the experiment, I mean, you can write that down in full generality. I show you immediately the experimental parameters we implemented. It's just 100 times effort, and effort is, a, is basically a number between 0 and 1, so you can in interpret effort as a probability. So effort is the probability of successful implementation of the project. And in the experiment, subjects face 12 different payoff structures like this in order to see the robustness of the, of the effects we are searching for. So this is a typical example. And you, could, you might, this could be, for example, one version of the authority game that makes it uh, transparent what we have in mind. There's a principle he can delegate or keep control. If, if the principle does not delegate, then the principle chooses his effort, which is capital E, and the variant of the project. And then payoffs are made, depending on um, the probability of success, OK? Or if the principal delegates, then the agent chooses effort and the, and the variant of the project, and that leads to payoffs. It's a very simple game, but it's already quite complicated for our purposes. Why? Well, 
for this reason. The principal, when he considers to delegate or not, has to form expectations about the agent's choices, about the agent's effort choices, about the agent's choices of the variant. Now, that implies that the principal's preference for risk aversion, for risk, for example, principal's risk aversion, principal's ambiguity aversion, but also principal's social preferences play a role. So they affect the delegation decision. So this game, if we would run this game in the lab, in the laboratory, we would not be able to elicit the pure preference for authority. Because we would have a host of confounds. Now the, the, the important contribution, I think, if it is important, uh, is that we solve this problem, basically, with a, a particular elicitation procedure. So what we, what we did is we, uh, we played a slightly different version of the game, uh, which looks as follows. So we elicit effort and variant choices via what's called in experimental economics the strategy method. So the strategy method, so for example, means that the agent makes a binding variant and effort choice for the case in which authority is delegated to him before he knows whether authority is delegated to him. And the same is true for the principal. The principal decides on a, on a variant and an effort level for the case he keeps authority before he knows whether authority is delegated. Now you might ask, how is that possible? Well, I'll show you in a minute. Uh, so, so these choices are all made before the outcome of the delegation decision is known. Okay? So basically, consider the two nodes here. So they make, a, the, the, the agent is asked, put yourself into this node, what would you do here? The principal is asked, put yourself in this node, what would you do here? And if it turns out that you end up at this node, the decision you made here is binding, is implemented. Okay? So, now, the implementation of the delegation outcome occurs according to the following rules. The principle fixes a minimal effort requirement, so we call that minimal agent effort, before knowing the agent's actual choices. Now, if the actual effort of the agent is bigger than or equal to the minimal agent effort, then authority is delegated and the agent's choices are implemented. If the effort falls below the minimal agent effort, authority is not delegated, and the principal's choices are implemented. Okay? That's the way we do it. And now let's see how we, from this procedure, how we can derive the pure value, the pure preference for authority. So consider this graph. Here you have expected utility. Here you have the effort of the agent. Now the first thing you you have to keep in mind, so if the principal uh, keeps authority and uh, if the principal keeps <coughs> authority, uh, then he knows everything. He knows his variant choice, he knows, he knows his effort, he knows his expected utility. And in particular, this level of expected utility that he implements given his choices is, const is not depending on the agent's effort. The agent's effort is irrelevant for him, so it's a constant. Now consider the expected utility when authority is delegated. It's clear that the higher the agent's effort, the more likely it is that the project is implemented successfully and the higher will be the principal's payoff. So for this range of effort levels here, uh, delegation is optimal because the expected utility when authority is delegated is higher. For this range of effort levels, no delegation is optimal. Thus, the principal should set the minimal agent effort exactly to this level. Why not, for example, to this level? Well, if the principal would set minimal agent effort to this level, what would that imply? That would imply that uh, if the agent's effort falls in this range, okay, then there would be no delegation. But the expected utility from delegation would be higher. That would be a suboptimal choice. So you can make basically, so it's a dominant strategy, if you like, to set in this game, to set the minimal agent effort to, 
in such a way that the expected utility from delegation is equal to the expected utility from non-delegation. Okay, having accepted that, let me first say some, uh, highlight some features of the, of this in elicitation methods. Well, the principle is fully protected against downside risk on the agent's effort choice because he sets a minimum agent effort and if the agent is below that minimum, there will be no delegation. Okay. So this rules out ambiguity version as an explanation for, uh, of a potential re required delegation premium. The principle reveals his point of indifference based on his own risk and social preferences. So whatever his preferences are with regard to ambiguity, risk, social, this is all included in the expected utilities. And he sets basically the minimum agent effort in such a way that taking all his preferences into account, he has in the different dimensions with regard to risk, with regard to ambiguity and social preferences, is all included in this measure of minimum agent effort. Okay? So this eliminates, as you will see, this eliminates the need to indirectly control for preference characteristics. Now, uh, uh, how does the, the math go? So there's not much math here, but a little bit. So, uh, well, before I do that, it's, it's important that you understand one thing. Uh, this, is, this, is my, this is my initial example I, 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 told, I showed you. This is one of these payoff, these of delegation games we, we play, or authority games. And so if the principal does not delegate, okay, if there is no delegation, then the principal's effort is important. So it's decisive for the outcome. And the, then the principal chooses his effort and his preferred variant. What does that mean? That means that in the case of no delegation, a particular lottery is generated. How does that lottery look like? Well, if the principal with probability E, the project is successfully implemented, and the principal will choose variant A because this is his preferred variant, OK? So the principle we get with probability E, the principle will get the 200 minus the cost of effort. And with probability 1 minus E, the project will be unsuccessful and the principle will receive 100 minus the cost of effort. Okay? And the agent, for the agent payoffs are, if the project is implemented successfully, the agent will receive with probability E 150. And if the the agent, this is this, 150, payoff of the agent. And if the project is not implemented successfully, then the agent will also receive 100. So what it basically means is no delegation decision generates a lottery. And let's call this the authority lottery because it's the lottery where the principal keeps authority, okay? And the same is true when delegation occurs. When delegation occurs, uh, we can speak about a particular lottery. We, we are in particular interested in the lottery that's generated by the mi minimum agent effort, okay? That lottery that's generated by the minimum agent effort would look, in a sense, similar but with different payoffs because if the agent would choose the minimum agent effort, what would happen? Well, with probability MAE, uh, the project is successful the principal would then receive only 150 because the agent would choose variant B, okay, and so on. So basically what we have here is the authority lottery is constituted by the no delegation decision. And for the delegation decision, we will have also a particular lottery, the lottery of interest. You could call it the lottery of interest, which I call the subordinate lottery, which would be that lottery that exactly occurs if the agent chooses the minimum agent effort. So uh, now let's in entertain the hypothesis that people value authority, okay? Uh, let's assume their utility function looks like that. So they, they derive a utility from the lottery and a utility from authority. And A equals one indicates that the individual has authority. A equals zero indi indicates that the individual has no authority. And A equals the empty set means that <coughs> the lottery is completely evaluated outside any authority relationship. Because within the authority game, 
there are always two aspects. There is the authority relationship between the, pe the two, uh, uh, principal and agent, and the lottery. But you could also give people just, you, you could not put them into an authority relationship, you could just confront them with that lottery. Okay? And then there would not be context of authority. Okay? And we have to distinguish between the evaluation of the lottery in the context of an authority relationship and the evaluation of the lottery outside the context of, a, of a, an authority relationship. Okay, so now some notation, uh, which will help. So facing the authority, if an individual faces the authority lottery and is the controlling party, let's call the expected utility from that, the utility from this lottery and from all having authority, okay? Facing the subordinate lottery and being the subordinate party means I face the utility of this subordinate lottery, which I indicate by X prime, Y prime, and MAE, and not having authority. And we learned already that individuals <coughs> will set these two terms equal. Okay? So the principle's optimal choice is that the first term, which is here, is equal to the second term. Okay? Now, I have written that up again here. Just, this is just the equality that follows from the optimal decision of the principle. Now, what you always can do is, you can always replace the lottery in, the, in this, uh, when you write it down, in, when you write utility down in this way, by its certainty equivalent. Because by the very definition of the certainty equivalent, that's the, just nothing but the monetary value that makes you equally well off than the lottery itself. So that's trivial. So you add instead of the lottery the certainty equivalent, OK? Now, assume for a moment that authority does not matter for utility. That means that A equals 1 and A equals 0 are irrelevant for utility. Thus, you can write this equation in this way. You can forget about the A's, so to speak. They are utility irrelevant. So basically, the utility of the certainty equivalent of the authority lottery has to be equal to the utility of the certainty equivalent of the subordinate lottery. Now, but that means that the certainty equivalents have to be equal. Otherwise, the utilities can't be equal. Okay, these, are, these are just monetary. You can think of monetary numbers here. So basically, if authority does not matter, the authority lottery, the certainty equivalent of the authority lottery has to be the certainty, certainty equivalent of the subordinate lottery. Now, again, the basic equation, which is just the optimality condition, if authority matters in the sense that Z paribus A equals 1 is preferred over A equals 0, so if I value authority positively, what does that imply? But if I value authority positively, then this side of the equation gets a kick because A equals 1 goes up, okay, relative to this side of the equation where A equals 0. But then equality can only hold if this certainty equivalent is smaller than this certainty equivalent. And so <clears throat> what we have is that if people put positive value on authority, then the certainty equivalent of the authority lottery has to be smaller than the certainty equivalent of the subordinate lottery. Or in, dif in different words, there is a premium that needs to be paid to the principal in terms of value, value in terms of certainty equivalence in order to make him willing to delegate. Okay? So that's, that would be the proof. And now, how, now we are almost done. <coughs> so, we do a second part of the experiment. So the experiment goes like that. They play this authority game that I described to you. In, so 12 different authority games. For each authority game, the principal's decision implements an authority lottery and a subordinate lottery. Then, after the 12 games are over, we take these authority lotteries and these subordinate lotteries and put them completely outside the context of any authority relationship and elicit the certainty equivalence of these authorities. Don't ask me how I did it. I don't have the time. I tell you it's possible. 
we have methods in experimental economics that allow us to elicit certainty equivalence of lorries in an incentive compatible way, and that's what we did. So basically, I have independent evaluations of these two lorries <coughs> outside the authority context. And if it turns out now that the subordinate lottery has a certainty equivalent that's systematically higher than the certainty equivalent of the authority lottery, I have proven that there is people place positive value on authority. Because these authorities are more valuable for them. They have a higher certainty equivalent. <coughs> that's the whole logic of the experiment, and I can come to the results, okay? So let's ask the question, do principles value authority? Well, they do. So this is the average certainty equivalent across overall principles. This is the certainty equivalent of the authority lottery, and this is the certainty equivalent of the subordinate lottery, and this is systematically higher by roughly 15 units. It's highly significant and indicates that on average, people value authority positively. Now, you could ask the question, how does that show up across these 12 different games? We wanted to see the robustness of our results to different parameter constellations. And what we find is that across all 12 games, the value of authority in terms of percentages, expressed in terms of percentages. This is, so to speak, this bar means that in, lottery two, in, in game two, uh, the subordinate lottery had a 15% higher certainty equivalent than the authority lottery. Okay? So across all 12 games, we find people value authority positively. It's not always significant, but most of the time. Uh, the next question uh, we can ask is, what about looking at heterogeneity across individuals? So do most individuals value it or only some? Now here we, we, we average over all 12 games for each individual and we look at the average value of authority across the 12 games for each individual. And what we find is, well, in this graph, let me explain. This is the average individual. So this data point, for example, means that this individual had an average certainty equivalent of, let's say, 115 for the authority lottery, and it had uh, an average certainty equivalent of 145 for the subordinate lottery. So, and you see that most individuals are above the 45 degree line. So some individuals are, do not put a high value on authority, but a fair amount of individuals puts a fairly high value on authority. So this establishes uh, my conclusion, yes, in this game at least, people do value authority positively. Now, preliminary summary of results. The certainty equivalents of the subordinate lottery are on average roughly almost 15% larger than the certainty equivalents of the authority lottery. The differences are highly significant and the difference can only be explained if the authority relationship enters the utility function. Okay, so this was uh, one of the papers we wrote on this. Now let's, let's look at a more complicated game, which was the first paper we wrote, so I presented in reverse order because our first paper was not as clean as the second one. So this is a little bit dirtier, <laughs> but it confirms basically what we find by the, by the clean paper. So in the more complicated game, we have the same structure as before but in addition, both the controlling and the subordinate party exert effort. So think of, I'm the principal, I can delegate or not, but regardless of whether I delegate, I make an effort choice that matters. Same for you as the agent, regardless of whether I delegate or not, you make an effort choice. Now, if I'm the principal and I keep authority, I will be the guy who makes the project choice. Okay, but uh, I may be unsuccessful my effort choice may lead to, and here you should a little bit reinterpret what, it, what the effort means. In the, old, in the first paper I presented, effort is best interpreted as implementation effort. Does the project, is the project successfully implemented? Here you interpret effort better as the, as the more effort you put in, the more you detect the available projects, the more you discover them. 
and you can discover them or not. And it, the information comes in a binary form. If you discover the available projects, you know all of them. If you don't discover them, you know none of them. Okay? So if you don't discover the, the projects that are available, that would <coughs> mean that, I mean, you don't know what to do. Okay? So it's just like making a blind choice. So in that case, you would want the agent to give you a recommendation because perhaps the agent has been successful because he also puts in effort. So this is why it's a more complicated situation. And vice versa, whoever is the controlling party, the controlling party may not successfully detect, discover the available projects, and then they can make recommendations. So it's a bit more complicated, but the logic is in, in, in essence the same. So this more complicated game allows us uh, to ask questions like, how do subordinates who know that they are subordinates choose effort? You see, in the old game, if I am the subordinate, my effort does not matter. Here, my effort always matters. Okay? Also, we can ask the question, how do controlling parties who know that they are controlling parties choose effort? And finally, we can also study the inhibition to delegate that arises from a pure preference for authority. So let me just shortly describe the results here. We have here four different parameter constellations, so in a sense, four different games. And in two of the games, the parameters were chosen in such a way that the risk-neutral agent and the risk -neutral, that the risk-neutral principle and, and the risk that fa who faces a risk-neutral agent would never delegate. He always keeps authority. In the other two games, the risk-neutral uh, principle uh, should always delegate when he faces a risk-neutral uh, agent. So in one case, no delegation. In the other, delegation. And what we find is this so these are the games where there should be no delegation. And I think theory does quite well. So we, we apply standard expected utility theory here. You see, this is a good result. Only 16% deviation. You always have some nasty guys in any experiment. Uh, 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 this can be rent. This can be trial and error. So, so this is good. But this is catastrophic, OK? Because they should delegate in 100% of the cases, and they only delegate in 45% of the cases. And here, it's similar. So we run at least 10 control experiments, because it's, it's more difficult here. Because we play, he play, he play the game in extensive form, and we have to control for risk preferences and beliefs and all that kind of stuff, so which induced us to run at least 10 other control experiments. So if you do a not-so-clean experiment, you are exposed force to to do a lot of effort to clean it up. That's what we did. Uh, so what happens here is these guys don't delegate, despite the fact that they would have earned much more money, and despite the fact that they believed they would have earned much more money, because we have their beliefs. So again, they seem to be willing to accept a lower profit in exchange for keeping authority which means that they put a value, a positive value on authority. And by the way, in both experiments, we find out Something that's perhaps interesting for you, loss averse individuals are more likely to keep authority. So we may have an independent measure of loss aversion, and they are more likely to keep authority. There's a kind of endowment effect in authority. And finally, uh, in the second experiment, we have also done a lot of work to understand the effort choices. And I can show you here the deviation of the effort choices from the equilibrium predictions. And this is a complicated graph, so let me explain it to you. Okay, slowly. <laughs> uh, and when you have understood it, it's just beautiful. <laughs> but at first sight, it's, it's complicated. So what you see here is the deviation of the agent's effort from the Nash equilibrium. So this is a positive deviation. This is over-provision of effort from Nash equilibrium. This is under-provision of effort. On this axis, you see the deviation of the principles effort from Nash equilibrium. This is over provision on this part of the axis. Here it's under provision. Now what does that mean, observations under P formal authority? P stands for principle. If the principle has formal <coughs> authority, so he does not delegate, okay? Then what happens? Then the principle has authority, okay? And he over provides relative to the Nash equilibrium. 
And this is, by the way, the 95% confidence interval. So this is why the picture is really beautiful. You have a significance test in the picture. So what you see here is significant over-provision of effort, significant over-provision of effort, significant over-provision of effort. Here it's not significant for the principle. And in, when you go in this direction, you see under provision now the agent under provision by the agent here 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 so it's three times under provision of effort by the agent relative to Nash and here the story is the other way around why because this is observation under a formal authority here the agent has received the, here the principle delegated what does that mean the agent is now the guy with authority and what does the agent do look at that the agent over provides effort so whoever is the guy who controls, is in control, he, they over-provide effort. Whoever is the guy who is subordinate, they under-provide effort. And again, we, we do this 10, one reason why we do so many control experiments is that we really have to argue, can we rule out risk aversion? Can we rule out social preferences? Can we rule out, so we do a host of controls, it's all in the paper, uh, that establish the conclusion that this, that having authority per se leads to extra effort. And by the way, not just relative to Nash equilibrium, also relative to best reply. Because we know the guy's beliefs. So we know, for example, here the agents believe about the principal's effort. Knowing if the agent knows the principal's effort, then the agent knows what the best reply is to the principal's effort. And we know it in particular. <laughs> and we can measure, does he overprovide relative to best reply and not just relative to Nash equilibrium? And that's a much stronger statement. They overprovide relative to best reply also. So, so there is over, there's consistent overprovision of effort. So authority seems to motivate, lack of authority seems to demotivate. Now, why, let me come to the why question. So I have, so far I have only, uh, documented, okay, what I claimed to be able to document at the beginning, but let's now ask the why question. Why is authority intrinsically valuable? No, I have no proof, I have only speculations on this. There are three psychological theories that could help us here. One is the theory of power motivation, going back to McClelland, who put forward the hypothesis that humans have a need for power, where power connotes an internal urge to influence and control other people. Now it's easy to see if that's true, then people would place a positive value to authority. Now self-determination theory by DC and Bandura, they postulate the hypothesis that individuals have a psychological need for autonomy. And notice, there is a, when you think of authority relations in terms of power relations, you could describe two different concepts of power. One concept of power is the power in the sense of control. One concept of power is power in the sense of agency. What do I mean by power in the sense of control? Power in the sense of control is power over other individuals. And power in the sense of agency is power to do. So to be an active agent. And I mean one example for the, that, that for example if you look at how children play sometimes, <laughs> or when children are in a lift, five children, everybody wants to push the buttons. It's just, Okay, so there's this pleasure from pushing the button, seeing the, seeing seeing something happen, and uh, so and the the third story could be empowerment theory. People value a sense of impact, competence, meaningfulness, and choice, and if and probably they have more of that when they have authority, and that could be a reason why they value authority. Then. Why, next final question, why is authority motivating and lack of authority demotivating? Well, the same theories might help us here. For example, self-determination theory. Individuals who have a need for autonomy may enjoy effort more when they have autonomy. Or in economic terms, their effort costs, their subjective effort costs may be lower. Or empowerment theory. Uh, people's effort motivation partly also derives from a sense of impact, competence, and meaningfulness. And then you, you, you come to these conclusions. I mean, these are, of course, speculations, in my view, that have not been verified in an economic context like we have put it forward. But they help us explain our facts, perhaps. 
And now let me come finally to the economic implications. Let's assume that what I have shown you in these two experiments is more generally true. What would that mean for economics? Well, a desire for authority may prevent efficient decentralization in firms. Why? Because there are guys who are going to lose. Even if they don't lose in pecuniary terms, they lose they, because they derive pleasure from authority. They lose, OK? It may cause inefficient efforts to provide reallocation of decision rights, all the political lobbying that happens in firms. It may be an obstacle in mergers and acquisitions. Some mergers failed because the guy <coughs> couldn't agree who is the boss. OK, this or this guy. Okay. There, are, there are famous examples, by the way, in, the, in economic history that mergers failed for that reason. Uh, it may also be behind managers' drive towards empire building. It may provide such a desire, may provide a reason why bureaucrats maximize their discretionary budget, because it means more authority, more decision rights over more people. It also may provide a normative reason for, terms limit, for term limits for politicians. This guy don't want to leave. They have to throw, I mean, in Britain you have this example. Thatcher had to be thrown out of office by, uh, uh, I mean, the same for the labor government. Hasn't it been the same? There was a guy who really wanted to get into office and the other guy didn't want to go. But uh, it, it was a disaster for the guy who, who went into office then, uh, Gordon Brown. Now, so, so there, may, there, may, there may be uh, normative reasons for term limits because these guys don't want to go. They think they are indispensable. That's at least what they say publicly, but it, maybe they have a desire for just being the guys in control. And then, so several of these implications are obviously related to the Cosian problem of vertical integration. I mean, this is all about, uh, many of these things obviously play a role in firms. Now, uh, what are the implications of motivational con of, of the, the demonstrated motivational consequences of authority? Well, if there are these extra motivations or this lack of motivation when you lack authority, then it means that it exacerbates the effort inefficiencies inherent in authority relations. What do I mean by this? Think of the following situation. I have the same effort cost function like you. We are in a company. Economic, first best would require that my marginal cost of effort is equal to your marginal cost of effort. Otherwise, we are not in the first best. So if I provide more effort, we have identical effort cost functions, then my marginal cost of effort is higher than yours. That's inefficient. Okay? But now there is this additional motivational kick that comes in when you have authority. So what you can show in these authority games, even standard theory predicts you get, in a, you get second best efficiency only. So the guy with authority does more in terms of effort, typically, than the guy without authority. So that's second best efficient. But now these extra motivations come in. That means I, does even, I do even more, because I have this other additional kick. And you do even less. So, so the gap increases. So it exacerbates the effort inefficiencies inherent in authority relations. It also suggests some maybe normative conclusions that it, I think our findings make sense for ideas like empowerment and job enrichment. Because it means that if you give more competences to subordinates, you may motivate them, per se. And finally, if empowerment and job enrichment is not possible, which may sometimes be the case, then our results suggest, if, if, at least if, if the type, if these are stable types, that you should carefully select those peop the people in those jobs <coughs> where they are subordinates who are not demotivated by being subordinate. So taken together, I think the economic implications of assuming a value of authority, a subjective value of authority, and having people mo be motivated or demotivated, depending on in which position they are, has quite important implications such that I think it, uh, these questions deserve more scrutiny, and that's what we want to do in the future. Thank you for your attention. Well, we have some time for uh, questions, and uh, we've got the stewards here with microphones. Uh, so uh, if you'd like to ask a question, please just put your hand up, and we'll, a microphone will come to you. 
going to start us off with a question. Um, yes, please. Hello. Um, uh, the, some, some of the examples you gave uh, seem to also relate to questions of prestige, and um, which, like, like the empire building or having a huge budget as, uh, <laughs> as a bureaucrat. Now, your um, experiments seem to specifically test for authority, as in having the decision right um, presumably doesn't have that much social prestige attached to it. Uh, do you also have some interest in sort of trying to distinguish between and quantifying the effect of social prestige versus specifically authority? Well, I mean, you are you're perfectly right. I mean, the, the, the illustrative examples I give have an ambiguous interpretation. So that it could be the motives I uh, dealt with here, it could be other motives. Now, I have been interested in, social sta in preferences for social status, which is somehow related to social prestige for quite a long time. It's, it is uh, quite a difficult question <laughs> to really uh, elicit these preferences. Uh, I would like to do this. Uh, I haven't not done it so far. But I think it's a worthwhile, uh, it's definitely worthwhile to do. Uh, but I have not done it so far. So I, I've been interested in not, not so much prestige, more status. Uh, ever since Bob Frank's book in 1984, The Quest for Status, which is a beautiful book, I thought it would be extremely good if we could have an empirical measure of, of, uh, of this preference for status. And, so far, I always fail. It's, it's just in the back of my mind as an unsolved question for me. <laughs> but I would like, if you can do it, great. Uh, hi. It's very nice to have you here in London. Um, I couldn't see clearly uh, whether in, in your experiments uh, was the case that when the principal had authority the social outcome was higher than when it was the case when the agent has had it. Uh, in, actually, I didn't look at this in this lecture. In, uh, you couldn't see it, I agree. It's, it's not <laughs> in, the, in, in what I have shown you. But uh, what I can tell you is that here, in this situation, both parties would be better off. Actually, we, show, we can show it empirically. So if the principal delegates here, the agent has a higher payoff than in case of non-delegation, and the principal has a higher payoff. So it's really social efficiency that declines here. So it's in the paper. You can download it from the internet. In the other situation, it's, it's more complicated. It's not, a, it's, it's, more a, it's not that efficient totally. It basically, here it's a parade. Delegation would be a parade to improvement here. Yeah. Both would be better off, but it doesn't occur, which is a particularly stark example where dele non-delegation can be harmful. But I didn't show you that, I agree. Hi, sorry, my question is about um, so how this would relate to real effort tasks. So yeah. in terms of how you, you phrase it here, obviously it's people would be selecting specific Probability. It's well, a number. It's a, a number there. Yeah, a number. So, it's zero and hundred. Yeah. So my question would be, uh, how? Or I'm, I'm not expecting you to have done this, obviously, but I know that in terms of um, stuff with dictator games and public goods games and trust games, when people have exerted re an effort through real effort tasks, that's dramatically changed how they then engage with the negotiation of the surplus. So my question is. Do you have any ideas of how you think that might affect this or plans to do something like that in the future? I, I wouldn't want to have to do 12 real effort tasks in one experiment, I must say. No, no, just a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Crazy, but yeah, it's a question about that. Well, we have, uh, let me put it that way. I mean, for example, in, the, in, the, in, in our work on fairness and reciprocity, when, when people do real effort tasks uh, and you design the experiment properly, then you very often see Similar, if, I mean, that, that's in the fairness literature. Uh, now, how it will play out here, I don't know. 
it's an open question. I mean, it could, it, it could, it, it could aggravate the effects. It could, it, but you could also find reasons, for example, boredom. I mean, not working, not really working can also be, sometimes you work because you would be totally bored by not working. Uh, so there are, you, I think you really have to look at the details of the effort tasks to see what could be the, the countervailing <laughs> tendencies that play a role here. I mean, the beauty here is that you control effort costs, and which is necessary for deriving the value of authority. But it, I, I, I mean, what I would like, I, what I hope is that people start, that this triggers a <laughs> literature, <laughs> uh, that uh, people start doing real effort experiments and also, also do lab experiments, further lab experiments, or cross-cultural, we plan cross-cultural experiments. So, for example, imagine, uh, a high case individual in India being the principal, does he have a higher value of authority? You would expect so. Huh? If he would have to delegate to a low caste individual, I mean, I could imagine that the value of authority in a hierarchical society is higher than in an egalitarian society. So and that could have Im important implications for if he had a, I mean, we are also, what I didn't show you here is we are still working on a simple measure of authority. So this is quite a bit complicated, what I showed you today. But the ideal would be just such a simple measure that you could do it in every survey. Uh, when you do a, comp a survey in companies, you measure the preferences for authority and could use it as a, left -hand, as a, as a right hand side variable in your uh, regressions. That would be quite interesting. interaction between the demotivational effect of authority and the justifiability of the distribution of authority. You have one end of the spectrum here where there is no particular reason for either person to have authority. So it's almost... So can you say again? I didn't Sorry, uh, you're dealing here with a case where there is no justification for why either P or A gets the authority. Yes. It's a random lottery. So yes, as yes. any of the two parties, I might get very upset because I don't see any reason why somebody else has authority. Yeah. Uh, if I think of myself in the director of the LSE, well, I can justify why he has yeah. more authority than I do. So I can think of one end of the spectrum where the distribution of authority is perfectly justifiable. Yes. And in that case, I don't think there should be a demotivational or a motivational choice of authority. I completely agree, yeah. I, I completely agree. So I think the way authority is allocated initially plays a role and, and the normal and the legit, how legitimate that authority allocation is. Uh, but this is just to start with. I mean, now we can do new experiments and can introduce some sort of justification. You can have, there are all kinds of tricks. This is probably the motivational effect is strongest when there is two people and they could equally likely get it. Yes, yes. Um, less strong when there is a clear demarcation, a clear yes. comparative advantage. For example, some, I mean, you see some authority, some authority relations are justified by differences in skill and competence. And then I would expect much less demotivation. In fact, uh, yeah, uh, I, com I completely agree. So, but that's, an, that's basically an additional factor that you bring in that we need to control for and we uh, have, to, have to look how it works out. I completely agree. It's a very good suggestion. Uh, if I understood you right, you said that the risk-averse people enjoy authority more? No, uh, loss-averse. Loss-averse. Loss-averse people. Okay. I mean, they are le more reluctant to delegate. So if you, we have an independent measure of loss aversion, if I plug that into a probit regression or a logit regression of the delegation decision, then this loss aversion measure is highly significant and, and predicts quite well differences in, in, in the willingness to delegate. Yeah, and would you similarly have anything that could indicate what people enjoy to be like subordinated? Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> that, would, that would be good. Huh? Yeah. I could sell but that you measure. Don't have any results from, uh, from here. I could sell that measure to dictators. <laughs> no, I, I have no idea. I'm sorry. Uh, hello. Um, so I was just 
thinking in terms of sort of the standard economic resource allocation issues and theory of organizations and how your research agenda kind of fits in. And it's a kind of slightly uh, kind of, you know, wide angle question about where you think the direction of this research program is heading. So the specific question is, you know, going back to the motivation of this as sort of a course lecture. One of course's insights we use all the time in economics is that people just negotiate and do side transfers to get at an efficient outcome. Mm -hmm. It's a bit related to the earlier question about what is socially efficient or joint surplus maximizing. Mm -hmm. So one way to think about it is that the fact that I like to call the shots or I enjoy authority is somewhere there is a relaxation of the assumption that money can buy me out. So at some level, that's one way to think about it, that it's a way of introducing a particular form of non-transferability of utility that, for example, you know, you cannot buy a dictator out uh, to take some kind of recent examples, whatever, it has to be coerced and so on. So that's one way to think about it, that you know, in some ways it is such a thing that you cannot really use a transferable, you know. But the related thing, though, is that maybe in economics, we focus too much on consequences, so we just care about the output, the profit, and so on. And what you're saying here, and you know, that's another way of interpreting the research program, is it's not just the output, but it's the person interacted, it's the allocation, you know, it's not that... It's also the, the relationship. Exactly, and, and, and that. Yeah. So they don't have to be mutually exclusive, but if you had some thoughts about you know, uh, which direction you think is the main thrust of this research agenda. Well, to be honest, uh, I, uh, I don't know yet the full implications. I mean, I think, for example, you, well, you mentioned that there could be some, uh, obst I mean, what it immediately da Im implies is that there is an ad additional friction in the allocation of authority, which could play an important role. And and by necessity, that you, you make the guy, one guy better off and the other guy worse off, just even if the incomes would not, uh, so, so there's a kind of zero-sum aspect, at least for ident people with identical preferences. Uh, but uh, I, I must confess that I, when I started my research on fairness, I could see all the implications immediately. <laughs> When I started this kind of work, I have this final slide uh, where I think, yes, it, I believe it's important, but in detail, I still have to work this out in future experiments. So basically, my answer is, I guess, uh, I, I really don't yet know what, where does this lead me. Actually, to be honest, we stumbled on this. So we, we started with this paper. So this is a, a nice example. So we were just interested in authority allocation. And we took the Aguillon-Tirol role paper and implemented it in the laboratory. And we were interested in some comparative statics and all that stuff. And in the end, we found the data, the most interesting aspect in the data is this. Uh, so we, this is a good example where you just happen to stumble on, on an effect and then you start exploring further and and exploring how, how general is it, uh, uh, putting in more complicated situations, uh, putting, looking at real effort, and all these things. And uh, this is the honest answer. So we stumbled on this uh, so two years or three years ago, and we're now able to give talks about it. <laughs> I hope interesting ones, but we will see what, what, we, what we will be able to, to further dig out. I'm interested in your suggestion that there might be some further cultural, cross-cultural work involved because I know you've done the ultimatum game with different cultures and here I think the application of authority, a measure you can use is that of the anthropologist Geert Hofstede. He, I think he has this measure of power distance okay. and also von Strompenars, they're Dutch anthropologists who look at these things within samples of corporations or government workers and so on and so forth. So that might be worth investigating. Great. As a I give you my card, send me an email <laughs> about these references. Thank you. Hi. Um, 
I would have also asked you about the cultural aspect because I think this is really intriguing, but uh, I gather you, you haven't yet done No, that. we haven't yet but, done But uh, some other things which would interest me, for example, is there a gender effect? Have you seen any? Oh, uh, yeah. Another thing is, um, did you do it with students only or would you? Or have you already gone to firms and asked employees about this issue? Or uh, another thing which is correlated with the latter question perhaps is an age effect. Yeah, no, nothing. We, I mean, we initially, in the first experiment, we some, at some point we thought there is a gender effect. And we were very happy. Women were delegating more. <laughs> but then it vanished uh, uh, <laughs> with more data. and. So we did it with students only so far. Uh, yeah, we, we don't have age effects. I, I, but I agree. I mean, that, that this could be all interesting. I, I mean, there's now this, in other domains, we have all kinds of research. You see, the, 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 the mere idea that there could be a preference for authority is totally alien to economics. I mean, we, we believe in preferences for risk, and time and now social preferences are finally also established on the scene but a preference for authority it's totally new and and I think we just have scrapped scratched the, the surface uh, I should take one final question from me thank you um, so this exactly relates to your last comments in terms of what is the social aspect do you see in this definition of authority in particular so I don't know how trusted those results are, but we have some results knowing that people are willing to bet on a coin less. They are doing what? They are willing to bet on a coin less when someone else is tossing the same coin than they are tossing the same coin. There's just the other part of it that once a coin is tossed, but its outcome is not revealed, people are again willing to bet less on that coin than if they do the betting before the tossing is actually revealed. Now, in some sense, I could see a relation between these coin tossing stuff and, uh, and sort of the risk preference or the crazy risk preferences in the, or in, in the sort of the first experiment. So the question is then what is really the social aspect that you think is behind this definition of authority or would authority be in some sense related to these strange risk preferences in these Yeah, we have experiments? Actually, we, uh, we could test for that just by letting people play against the computer. And that's what we plan, I think, in the near future. So the agent is a computer that's somehow programmed. And then we could, I mean, on the other hand, there's still the notion of being subject to some random device. So we are still struggling with that, how we isolate that. But it's definitely worthwhile to do. So we don't, so we are, uh, Holger Herz gives a talk tomorrow why it's different from illusion of control which is the examples you mentioned. Uh, and, uh, but uh, we do have not, you see what we also not ca cannot do is, is it a disutility from being the subordinate or is it a utility from being the, 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 the guy with authority? It's not separated here. It's just the net the overall effect that we have. Uh, so there's a lot to do for you <laughs> to to, to do run more experiments in this uh, in this research area. Well, that seems like an excellent moment on which uh, to thank Professor Fair, and uh, there is uh, the reception in the atrium immediately after. Thank you very much indeed for a very stimulating lecture.